Hello, listeners. It's time for the greatest hour of wrestling podcast you'll ever listen to. This is Something Else with Ari and KJ, episode number 003. Today, we recap Mid-South Wrestling from December 10th, 1981. To join me on this endeavor is my co-host. He is carefree with a capital K. He is KJ. KJ. Hello. I am doing great. I am I am peachy today. How about you? Peachy, you say? I am peachy. Oh, I am fantabulous this morning. I slept until like 11.30, so I mean, that that's a heck of a night's sleep right there. Well, to be fair, you did go to, we did go to, you did go to bed late. <laughs> yes, but when you wake up every day at 6.30 in the morning, it's like, even when you go to bed at 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock, it's like half the time you start, you wake up at 6.30, even if it's just to look at the clock, roll over and go, ugh. True, because your body's just used to waking up at that time. Yes. I, I don't know what happened because I used to be that person that, like, if I didn't set an alarm clock, I would sleep till at least 10 o'clock every day, like, without question. And then all of a sudden, a few years ago, something just broke in me. And it's like, the majority of the time, even on my days off, I'm awake by 7. That's how I am, too. Um, even when I was in school, like, uh, throughout the weekend, throughout winter vacation, I would always still wake up around, uh, oh, my God, I forgot what time I woke up. It was, like, 5.30 or 6. And <laughs> I, I got to tell you, like, I, I'm kind of grumpy nowadays when I wake up because of an alarm clock. I was miserable as a teenager waking up to go to school. And I liked school. So it's not like, you know, oh, man, yeah, that's why I was miserable. Nope, nope, I was just miserable about the forced wake-up process. Honestly, same. And I hated um, – I always hated in the colder months because I would just be freezing. No matter what, I would just be freezing, and that would be another deterrent from making me want to get out of bed. I was tired and just cold. I absolutely hated it. But like you, I, I enjoyed school. Well, plus part of the problem, and I mean, this continues today as adults when you go to work, it's like during the winter months, you're going to school while the sun is just barely coming up uh, and you're coming home right around the time it starts to descend. I know. It makes you feel like a vampire or something. Yeah. You never get to see sunlight. It's around like December, January, February time frame, it's just... It's gross. It was like the only advantage um, in my high school. We had like two separate buildings. One was the primary high school and one was um, called the career center, kind of like a book tech type place. And there was a lot of crossing in between the two. And even when the weather is crappy, it's like, well, you know, you get a, a little bit of outside fresh air, blah, 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 walking between the two. Look at you, Miss Fancy, being able to walk outside of school to the other school. Uh, My school was just one big building. And while it did have like a couple of windows in the classroom, they were always opaque. So you couldn't see through them. I, uh, in eighth grade, one of the schools we went to, and this is going to be one of those long stories explain why I said one of the schools we went to, the basement uh, floor, or the main floor actually, it's like all the windows were up really high and blocked. So it's like you couldn't even see out them. Yeah, that's how my elementary school was. Nice. You don't want these kids crawling out the window. <laughs> I don't like... Uh, if, since it was elementary school, the windows were so high, we would probably have to stand on each other's shoulders 10 kids high. <laughs> so in eighth grade, I got to tell you, sir, since I kind of started mentioning it, uh, they were opening up a brand new elementary middle school, but it wasn't finished being co- uh, constructed when school started. So we started the year at one school, and then around Christmas time, we switched to a second school, and then at Easter is when we switched to the new school. So we, uh, <laughs> yeah, we literally went to three different schools when I was in eighth grade. So which one was your favorite? 
Honestly, the third one, the new school, was really nice. Um, the second school was a block away from my house, so, you know, that was great. Because, I mean... You just walk home so so easily. Yeah. It's like, you know, school started at, like, 7.40, 7.50. It's like I'd walk over at 7.45. It's like, you know, it's... Uh, and that was, like, the one year where it's like I didn't mind so much the early wake-up because, like, I got a little bit of extra time. So, yeah. It's That's funny. A- um, my middle school was right across from the high school. So um, when I graduated, well, yeah, when I passed middle school, I just mm-hmm. had to walk across the street and not go to the high school. I'm trying to think where in New Bedford there's a middle school across from the high school. Or, or you had both, right? No, I went to um, New Bedford High. Oh. I th- Keith I'm- is right across from it. Oh. To be honest, because, you know, I didn't grow up around here. It's like I've never really gone near the high school. I've been to Vogue a couple times for different things, but uh, I've never actually been to New Bedford High. Not that it, like, it's, why would it's I big. go? But, yeah, I've, a couple times I've driven by it. It's like, you know, it's a pretty nice-sized campus. Mm-hmm. All right, so for everyone who's tired of listening to us talk about, you know, school... Let's talk about wrestling. Uh, how, how does that sound? Oh, is that what this podcast for? Allegedly. Ah, okay. Uh, I guess I'll try that out. Alrighty, so hang on. We'll be right back, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, before we get going with our Mid-South Review, we did want to quickly mention all of the amazing places that you could listen to our dulcet tones in case wherever you're listening to, you don't like. So we are available on angrymarks.com and YouTube. You can also check us out at tinyurl.com slash something else pod. We're also on Spotify, Apple podcast, Google podcast, Podbean, Castbox, Overcast, Pod Paradise, Castro, Podbay.fm, and Radio Public. Again, all very real places. I don't believe you. Well, you should. I don't know why you wouldn't believe me. All right, I believe you now. Okay, good, 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 good. You convinced me. Yay! I was able to convince people. This podcast is sponsored by the amazing people at BetterHelp. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's time for the sponsor plug, so I'm just going to fast forward three minutes. However, what if I told you that the next three minutes could potentially save your life or the life of someone you love? If you think you might be feeling depressed, stressed, anxious, or overwhelmed, BetterHelp is here to help. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help you in a private online environment at your convenience. Take it from someone who went through their own mental health crisis. Sometimes you don't feel comfortable talking to family or friends. It can be beyond helpful to have a therapist you can trust and who can help you get through everything. BetterHelp has a network of over 20,000 therapists with a broad range of expertise that will give you access to help that may not be available in your area. All you need to do is fill out a questionnaire with your specific needs and they will match you with a therapist in under 48 hours. If things aren't working out with the therapist that they match you with, don't worry. You can request a new therapist anytime at no additional cost. Over 3 million people have already taken charge of their mental health with an experienced BetterHelp therapist. And right now, you can get 10% off of your first month by going to betterhelp.com slash something else. That's betterhelp.com slash something else. Welcome back, fans and friends of Mid-South Wrestling. It's Ari and KJ here to discuss Mid-South Wrestling, December 10th, 1981, 
taped November 25, 1981, at, of course, the Irish McNeil Boys Club in Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, this week's show uh, is going to be hosted by Boyd Pierce, along with Ernie Ladd, who is a lot more interesting to listen to than Bob Roo. And uh, we're going to go right now. First, we're going to start things off with their introduction, and I'll be right back to talk about the show. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Mid-South Wrestling Television Network. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce. Lots of exciting action. Listen to some of the matches. You'll see tag team action featuring a junkyard dog teaming up with Mike George and a mixed tag team bout. The little midget girls will be two of the contestants. <laughs> Ted DiBiase takes on Paul Orndorff. Jim Garvin is here against the Polish prince Ed Wyskowski. King Cobra, Brian Blair, all the top stars will be on the card. We'd like to remind all you fans that just three weeks remain for you to enter the dream match. That means the match that you want to see here on Mid-South Wrestling the first week, January the 6th, the taping of Mid-South Wrestling, the letter that gets the one card and the match that you want to see and receives the most votes will be there. And let me tell you some of the names that will be in the area during that week that you can vote on. Andre the Giant, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, Ted DiBiase, Junkyard Dog, Alpha and Seeker. The Samoans will be off of their suspension on January the 2nd. So send those dream cards to Mid-South Wrestling in care of the television station you're watching, and they'll forward us on to us. Our guest commentator, the man who needs no introduction, right. the wrestling fans all well, We're going to give them one anyway. It's good to be on Mid-South once again, although Mid-South don't particularly want me here, but I am the best. That's why I'm always around. All right. We'll... All righty. Uh, the, the introduction was for the people who didn't know what philanthropist was. Yes, and the good news is Ed Wiskowski is going to be back this week, which you you know he's my all-time favorite wrestler. You must have, like, audibly cheered when they said that. I jumped up and down, man. In celebration when I found out that Ed Wiskowski was going to be back this week. Um, so I noted that the expression on um, Ernie Ladd's face when uh, uh, Boyd Pierce mentioned Andre the Giant would be here the first week in January, he just glared at uh, uh, Boyd there. Um, and then they throw it to the ring. Now, this is where it's going to get funny. It's the Monk versus Brian Blair who, if you recall, were in the last match of the prior show that we talked about last week. And this show was taped immediately after last week's show. So these two had their tag team match that went to a time limit draw. They walked to the back. You know, they reset. Boyd Pierce changed his clothes. They came back out. And out came the Monk and uh, Brian Blair again to have a match. Or as I like to call him, the Monk Show. The Monk Show. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by the way, this will not be the first time they do this. Uh, they s misspelled Brian Blair's name. They gave him a Y instead of an I there. <laughs> which, again, is hilarious because they just taped the prior week's show where they spelled it correctly. You think they would use the same title cards, but they just redo it every week? Of course. Um. Now, th the Samoans who Ernie Ladd is managing are heels, and they're on suspension. But at no point does anyone ever say, I believe, why they were on suspension. It's just one of life's great mysteries. Yeah, I thought they would explain it later in the show, but to no avail. Apparently not. Um, Larry Dallas was back this week, which makes Larry. sense. Larry! <laughs> which makes sense as the show was taped at, like, Five minutes before this one and for those who don't know uh larry dallas is the uh gentleman in the front row at the irish Radio boy center he's an older gentleman in glasses and a cowboy hat he's there with i'm assuming his wife and their family um but he just sits there and the majority of the time he sits there with his fist up on his knee and just staring while chewing his chaw and not making a whole lot of motion either way Larry Dallas and his family are a very serious group of people. His family, not so much. Like I don't know if the I think the kids are with them, and the kids are all jumping and yelling and screaming. But uh, Larry Dallas does not have time for these offbeat shenanigans. Uh, not a whole lot to say about this match. Blair wins uh, after taking most of the match. He uh, hooks on an abdominal stretch. 
that he then yanks down into almost like a crucifix uh, type maneuver for the pin. The fact that Blair can pick up uh, the Monk Show is uh, amazing to me. Did you explain why we're calling him the Monk Show? Um, well, he's called the Monk, but he just reminds me of the Big Show because he's tall, bald, and he has that same black singlet. So I just call him the Monk Show. There we go. Uh, King Cobra versus Tom Renesto Jr. Renesto wearing his finest Motel 6 bathrobe. <laughs> and that, by the way, might be an insult to Motel 6 bathrooms. Or bathrobes, excuse me. And I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't talk too much crap about Motel 6 since I'm going to be staying in one in a couple of weeks when I go to Chicago for the all-out pay-per-view. Just so, the Motel 6 management is so like you wake up there surrounding your bed. <laughs> just covering me in old ratty bathrobes. Heard you talking smack, Aria. Um, we get the funniest part of the match. Cobra locks on an arm bar, and I'm going to play the audio. I want you to listen closely and listen for the fans in the audience. And again, this is King Cobra locking on an arm bar on Tom Renesto. King Cobra used a few high risk moves there. Ernie Ladd would be in that slide right up from under him and hurt him. A Bob Rupert slide right up from under him and hurt him. Tom Renesto Jr. is a young upcoming star. If you really want to make a name for yourself, I advise all young wrestlers to come to Mid South. Well, well, Tom Renesto Jr. is hollering no, he will not give up. King Cobra's trying to make. Yes, Tom Renesto is yelling no, he will not give up. So. All the girls in the crowd are screaming yes at him. It's like Daniel Bryan has showed up at the Irish McGill uh, Boys Club. Oh, boy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't uh, King Cobra miss a drop kick? Uh, I believe so. I didn't make note of it, but I do recall him missing a drop kick. Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Everything was not airtight back in 1981. You know, KJ. I still no, no. I still think the match was great. Yep. Uh, Cobra wins. Mm. Cobra wins with a jumping headbutt. Um, now, before our next match, which is Jim Garvin versus Ed Wiskowski, I want to go back in time to the end of the Cobra Renesto match, where Ernie Ladd voices his opinion on Ed Wiskowski versus Jim Garvin. Not for a little girl midget stars here this week. They'll be on. Of course, I included that program. part in. Next of course. Jim Garvin against the Polish Prince, Big Ed Wiskowski. So I, would, action, I would buy a ticket to go see that match. That Ed Wiskowski is a big one. tag team action also features the formidable duo of the Junkyard Dog and Mike George. It will be a tremendous team as they approved in days gone by. Tell you something. It's true, I can't stand the Junkyard Dog, but he's tough. I have to give credit where it's due. He's tough. But I'm tougher. The Samoans are tougher. Bob Brooks tougher. Now let me. Bob is tough, but. Or I'm sorry, JYD is tough, but Ernie and the Samoans and Bob Brook are tougher. But by the way, my favorite is he says that he would not pay money to buy a ticket to see Ed Wiskowski versus Jim Garvin. Me too, Ernie. Me too. <laughs> And speaking of Ed Wiskowski versus Jim Garvin, uh, Reeser introduces Jimmy Garvin weighing in at 215 pounds. Ernie Ladd immediately says Garvin weighs 230 to 235. So I just, you know, assumed that Garvin, you know, had a big thick milkshake or something before the bell rang to really pack on the poundage. Make himself look more intimidating. I got you. Exactly. In case, you know, the black curly afro didn't do the trick. <laughs> it, it took four minutes but something semi-exciting finally happened in this match uh, what happened was Ed hung Jim up into the tree of woe the referee immediately unhooked Garvin's foot and removed any potential excitement because we cannot have excitement in this match of course not no um I would agree, and this is where I said I would agree with Ernie's prior assessment about not buying a ticket to this. Garvin slaps on a sleeper, but Ed throws him out of the ring, and Ed wins with a gut buster. I apologize if I made this sound exciting at all. 
Um, I really have nothing to add about the match. You summed it up quite well. Thank you. I thought I did a fantastic job there. <laughs> um, we go next to the Mid-South Tag Team Champions, Junkyard Dog and Mike George, in a non-title match against Jerry Novak and Steve Holt's older brother, Aaron Holt. Um, we're going to show you the intro here, and then I'll be right back as Boyd's going to pitch to the end of last week's match, which we discussed last week. If you want to hear that, talk about it last week, but then uh, we'll be right back after Boyd talks about it. Hey, fans, I don't have to tell you, fans, that our viewers of Mid-South Wrestling, either here on television or in the arenas, the Junkyard Dog, one of the most popular stars ever to wrestle anywhere, one of the most capable grapplers and athletes ever to view and to ever be seen. It seems like he always has to battle himself against two or three opponents. Last week was no different. We're going to show you what happened last week in the Junkyard Dog's match against Terry Arndar. So let's watch right now. And I also think Boyd, he's not overselling JYD's popularity. Because if you go to... Uh, you know, people who lived in New Orleans at that time, they'll tell you, you know, that JYD was more popular than, you know, anybody on the New Orleans Saints at the time. And this is before the Pelicans were there. So, you know, JYD was their sports star in New Orleans. Um, and uh, now before we go on with the actual match, Boyd and Ernie are going to recap, you know, what happened last week. Again, you saw the Junkyard Dog against more than one opponent has happened so many, many times. What about it, Ernie Lad? You liked it, didn't you? <laughs> Junkyard Dog only got what he had coming, you know. There are a lot of people around. I got to defend it because there were other people that disliked the Junkyard Dog. Hey, man, a lot of people disliked the dog. He only got what he had coming. And, you know, let me tell you one thing before you go to the next match. I don't care what they said just a few weeks ago. They had 12 men on the field, the Detroit Lions did, I guess the Dallas Cowboy and Tom Landry protested and protested, but Pete Rozelle came on TV and said there was no way they could change the rules and there was no way Junkyard Dog could get his hand that goes in the record book as a defeat for the dog, and I enjoyed it. It's just that simple. You don't care how the dog gets defeated. You like it, don't you? I love it. Tell everybody it. to their own view. We're going to see the Junkyard Dog and Mike George in action. Let's go to the ring for the introduction. So, uh, Ernie Ladd, obviously not a fan of the Junkyard Dog. And really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, who would have thunk it? The way he talks, I thought the two of them were bestest good friends. Yeah. Uh, we go to Tag Team Champions, JYD and Mike George, like I said, versus Jerry Novak and Aaron Holt. Um, now, the Tag Team Champions in Mid-South, it, it's not going to be smooth sailing, you know, the next couple of years. But by and large, the tag team champions are usually just, you know, two singles wrestlers that are loosely aligned that become champions. They don't have very much in the way of actual teams. So you'll see your Junkyard Dogs and Mike George. Well, yes, they do have the Samoans. You know, the Samoans aren't just here nonstop for the next, you know, 10 years or whatever. Um, and despite George being the legal man in this match, by the way, the fans were warned of this match in the first two, shockingly, I know. But despite George being the legal man, JYD pinned Aaron Holt with a thump power slam. Okay, Jay. Um, so do we hear anything from Jerry Novak and Raymond Holt ever again? Well, this wasn't uh, Raymond Holt. This was Aaron Holt. But, yes, I'm pretty sure both men return in the future. Oh, oops, I have it written down as Raymond Holt. Never mind. <laughs> Raymond Holt, the captain on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, was not that's, in this match. That's <laughs> That's probably why I just read the name Holt, so I just automatically put Raymond in front of it. I, Other well, than that, I don't have any, anything to say. <laughs> what do you think would be worse for Raymond Holt? Uh, dealing with Jake Peralta for seven years? Or uh, wrestling the Junkyard Dog and Mike George here? Honestly, if Raymond Holt did become a professional wrestler, I would be like his number one fan, probably. Not, not the actor playing Raymond Holt. Raymond Holt. Yeah, he came from the B99 universe and just became a professional wrestler. Yes. That, that, that is a uh, cutaway gag from Brooklyn Nine-Nine that we never saw. We didn't know... I know. We, 
We didn't know we wanted it until we had it. I know we should have been in the writers' room when it still aired. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm sure Andy Samberg would have been delighted by our input, <laughs> and then asked, then asked who the hell we were and to get out. <laughs> he would have let us out. Though he would have called security if we were lucky. Okay. Um, Iron Cheek is back with Skandor Akbar in his corner against Buddy Ryan. Reeser, for some reason, doesn't introduce Skander. And I should point out that, shockingly, this is not future NFL head coach Buddy Ryan that Iron Cheek is wrestling. But And if I was a fan of football, I would have gotten that joke. Yes. And um, it did lead me to my great idea for a dream match. NFL's Buddy Ryan versus pro wrestler Buddy Ryan. Who do you think you who who do you think you would win in that instance? I think Buddy Ryan would win. Ah, okay. I see. I thought Buddy Ryan would would win. See, I know why you think that, but Buddy Ryan, he's got the tools, and he's just uh, you know slick enough that he might uh, be able to get through and get the victory. True, true, but. A lot of times, Buddy can slip up, but Buddy, on the other hand, he has all those years of experience, and he has a no-nonsense attitude. That is very true, but don't uh, don't count Buddy out, you know. You know, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree on this. Yes. Uh, Sheik had the match won a couple times, but Akbar kept telling him to beat on Buddy Ryan, the wrestler. It would have been hilarious if he was beating on Buddy Ryan, the football coach. But, <laughs> hey, you know, we don't need that kind of shenanigans. Um, and Sheik wins with a German souffle. Um, and after the match, um, because, again, it's wrestling. This is real. We want to, you know, acknowledge the real athletic accomplishments of our wrestlers. Uh, Boyd Pierce is going to congratulate Ernie Watts. Well, what we were saying a while ago, Ernie Ladd being inducted into the San Diego Charger Hall of Fame. And like we tell it, ladies and gentlemen, on Mid-South Wrestling, we congratulate you, Ernie. We appreciate what you've done in professional sports. We look forward to you as our guest commentator and continue to be a great wrestler, even though we don't agree with your tactics. This is USA Free Enterprise and gives you an opportunity whichever way you think is the best. <laughs> we'll be back with more action after this word from Mid-South. So not only does Boyd congratulate Ernie on legitimately entering the San Diego Chargers Hall of Fame, um, but also mentions one of uh, Bill Watts' favorite phrases. And it's one of those things that, you know, if we started a Bill Watts drinking game, you know, we might be drunk by the end of reviewing some of these episodes. He mentions free enterprise, which will be brought up over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I will keep that in mind. Yes. Um, any thoughts on the match? The only thing I have is um, the Iron Sheik. Uh, <laughs> he, he reminds me a little bit of uh, Nikita Koloff. In what ways? Uh, well, the body type and um, his face. They, they look a lot alike to me. It's uh, kind of funny you say that because Sheik then goes to the WWF in a little bit to team with Nikolai Volkov, another Russian. So, you know, you got the right idea, the Russian and the Iranian. Oh, okay. All righty. So, up next, we have a mixed tag team match. And I'm going to explain to you what the match is. And then I'm going to send you to Reese Bowden, who's going to introduce the match. It is a mixed tag team match where you have a full-sized male wrestler teaming with a, um, we talked about this last week, I apologize in advance, he, he teams with a midget female wrestler, um, a little person, for lack of a better word, and they, you know, and there's two teams of that. If you thought I was awkward introducing that, let's go to Reese Bowden with the introduction for this one. Now it's mixed tag team action featuring the little girls and the big men. This event is for one fall with a 10 minute time limit. In the red corner, from Richmond, Virginia, Diamond Lil. 
and her partner from Alexandria, Louisiana, Ricky Ferrara. In the blue corner, from Pensacola, Florida, Barbie Doll. And her partner from South Wales, Tony Charles. Team action. The way he described it made me feel like I was put on a watch list for listening to that. I, I, I think uh, we all kind of feel the way. It's a tag team match featuring the little girls and the big men. <laughs> okay. I, I, there's nothing more I can say here about that introduction here. It's just, it, it, it's one of those things here. Um, now, when I was a, when I was a kid, you know, they had, you know, little people wrestling, you know, not all the time, but frequently enough. I legitimately, when I was a kid, I thought that they were actually children wrestling. Not like, oh, really? yeah, not like actual adults who just weren't full size. And it's actually amazing how many people actually thought that, including what I remember reading his book, Bret Hart thought that they were children when he saw them in Stampede Wrestling. So... Yeah, you know, I'm not the biggest idiot in the world, but yeah, at the time, that's what I thought. And I mean, that's when I was, you know, 24, 25 years old, but, you know. <laughs> at least you know better now. Uh, we'll, we'll give you that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that here. Uh, now, it, it's kind of funny because... You know, it's kind of weird that Bill Watts is not a fan of, the, you know, the real big gimmick wrestling. Um, but he knew the fans would enjoy seeing the little uh, people wrestling. And he put two men who had as much credibility as Jerry Novak and the Monk in there. And I also noted, and, you know, maybe I'm going to notice this, he had two men that weren't way much bigger than the women. You know, did you notice that? Yeah. Um, and also, it's like he also wasn't putting his pushed wrestlers in the skimming match. He didn't put, you know, Iron Sheik on one side and Teddy DiBiase on the other side. You know, he put Rick Ferrara and Tony Charles in there. And um, Lil uh, kept using a catapult on Barbie doll. Um, Ernie Ladd, who can talk for an hour straight, had nothing to say while Ferrar and Charles were wrestling. Um, and they did mention, and I was very sad about this. I don't know about you, but this is my saddest moment. They said that the little the little women won't be here for the dream match. Uh, so my dream of seeing Barbie Doll versus Andre the Giant didn't work. A and I had prepared like a thousand postcards. And yeah, you know, stamps are sixty cents these days, so that's what six hundred dollars that I spent in postage to get Barbie doll versus Andre the Giant is not gonna work. Maybe someday they'll just uh, release a a rest a classic mid south video game where they'll have all the wrestlers, including uh, Barbie doll, and you could have her fight against Andre the Giant. Have your fantasy match right there. There you go, WWE. Are you listening? WWE Two K Twenty Three. We need Andre the Giant and the little female wrestlers. Um, a crisscross spot ended with Barbie somehow pinning Lil. She basically just stood there and held Barbie's legs, and somehow that counted as a cover. Do you have anything to add to this one? Um, it was just a very uh, interesting match. I, I, I'll say that. It was, it was entertaining. The next up was the main event, which was actually the main event. North American heavyweight champion Ted DiBiase versus Paul Orndorff. Um, it is kind of wacky. They put it at the end of the show. However, being a main event that started with about seven minutes left to go in the show, you kind of knew what the finish was going to be here. Um, and for some reason, I made a timestamp of Ernie Ladd talking about Cadillacs and Lincoln, so I'm going to play that here. Let's play it here. Should really be Ernie Ladd. Well, I must say this. The two finest made cars in America to be the Cadillac and the Lincoln. I think the Cadillac and the Lincoln is in the ring right now. Paul Arndorf is the Cadillac, my buddy. Hey, I'm going to 
Cause I drive cattle like that's what I drive. All our dogs gonna take it home for us. Ain't no love between these two men, I guarantee you that. you and I own a opposite side. You own a Cadillac but and I own a Lincoln. I, so you own a Lincoln and I own a Cadillac. I do not care what you say. I'm going with Paul Arndorf. Because I've had many a battle with Paul Arndorf. Paul Arndorf and he's rough. So, yeah, that's why I mentioned it. Because he manages to compare them to Ted DiBiase and Paul Arndorf. Of course, if this was WWE 2022, you know, they would have just randomly been talking about their cars. Hey, Aria, I have a Toyota. Hey, I got a Nissan. And I oh, think wow. I think the Nissan is better. I think the Toyota is better. Oh, we're, we're going to come to blows here, I think. Now, uh, sh- to the shock of everybody, I'm sure, Ted DiBiase and Paul Orndorff was the best match of either taping. Um, and... It's not even close. Um, and the story of this match continues last week's story where Bob Roop said that he came up with a counter to the figure four leg lock. And KJ, I hope you're sitting down. I hope the people sitting at home are sitting down. The counter to the figure four that Bob Roop and Paul Orndorff discovered is the same counter that you immediately think of when you think of a counter to the figure four leg lock. It's they turn the pile over. Whoa. And, of course, when you turn the pile over, it the pain magically moves from the receiver to the giver. And, <laughs> um, and that's what happens here. DiBiase goes to the figure four. Orndorff uses the magic counter and turns it over. And it, you actually literally see Ted having to keep his leg in the move because otherwise it was just going to fall apart. And the funny thing is, he reversed it, and Ted was right next to the ropes. All Ted had to do was jut his hand out just a little bit, and he would have had the ropes. But he didn't. And he stayed in the hold until the end of the show. Uh, He doesn't submit, and it ends in a time limit draw. I was going to say, that was easily the longest figure four I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> it came uh, to a point where they looked like they were both caterpillars because both their heads were like bopping up and down at the same time. <laughs> uh, and so the storyline is going to continue here for a few weeks. Uh, Paul Ondorf was able to reverse Ted DiBiase's figure four, but Ted did not give up. Would Ted have given up if the match went another 30 seconds? Who knows? But, you know. That's it for this week's show. Um, So for a rating for this week, last week I gave it an even six. This week I'm going to do the same, another even six. Uh, I felt this one was entertaining, so I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it an eight. All right. So I gave it a six. KJ gave it an eight. And that's going to do it for uh, this week's review. Hang on one moment and we'll be right back to close out the show. All righty, so we're back. We're not here to reverse the figure four or to continue to fantasy book Andre the Giant versus uh, Barbie doll, but uh, we are here to close out the show and talk about some weird news of the week. Uh, and this week's weird news of the week, which, by the way, is sponsored by Nobody. Nobody, the company that sponsors nothing. Oh, I love using them. Yeah, they're one of our best sponsors. Um, so for the weird news of the week, we go to the USA mullet championships seeks America's best mullets. This is from UPI.com, uh, from August 19th. So yesterday voting is underway for the kids and teens division of the USA mullet championships in annual contest to find the best quote unquote Business in the front, party in the back, haircuts in the country. <laughs> the online polls to pick the best kid mullet and teen mullet in the United States open Monday and will close Friday. 
The kids' division included 25 finalists, whittled down from a field of nearly 700 entries, and the teens' division featured 11 finalists, narrowed down from 80 uh, entries. And, you know, we make fun, but I'll tell you what, uh, the prize is $2,500. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I, okay, I would enter at that point then. I, I know. I I would get a stupid haircut for $2,500, potentially. You think I could enter that? Uh, I'd have to shave a little bit up top there, because, I mean... Mm, that ain't happening. Oh, Honestly, if someone were to ask me to sum up America in a single article, I think that's the one I would send to them. I... Uh... I, I went online this because uh, I wanted to see some of these potentially award-winning mullets, and um, the contest closed yesterday, the nineteenth. So you can't vote for it anymore. As I think I saw that story uh, actually yesterday on Facebook, and to show the winner of um, the kids' division, or at least one of the runner-ups, and uh, the mullet was glorious. Like it was. Very mullety, as you would expect. But if I remember right, the side had, like, the American flag um, shaved into it. So, nice. yeah. They have, they have a YouTube video. I guess they talked about this on the Today Show. Um, but, like, the kid they showed, it's just, like, I mean, it's a pretty epic mullet, but there's no American flag or anything there. Um, Got to step up the game. Yes, and apparently they get a trophy if they win, too, which, I mean, I... I try to win just for the trophy please tell me it's in the shape of a mullet sadly they do not show the trophy oh god (laughs) however in the interest of you know being fair and all that crap uh there's a ten dollar registration fee and that goes to the charity group stop soldiers suicide which Uh you know we're definitely all for you know that yeah, if it's reducing the risk of suicide, uh, more power to them, seriously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I um, Also, did they mention that Billy Ray Cyrus was one of the judges? That's who this kid kind of looks like. His mullet looks like Billy Ray Cyrus. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I know I've seen that hair before, and I couldn't place it. <laughs> but, oh my god. Um... I, 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 we're doubling up on weird news of the week because I just saw a uh, second great news story, also from UPI.com, also written by Ben Hooper, who apparently writes all of our weird news stories. Pomeranian chases bear through Colorado neighborhood. That's alpha as hell. A Colorado woman's home security camera captured video of the moment that a black bear wandering through her neighborhood was chased off by a neighbor's small dog. (laughs) The Castle Rock resident said her wise security camera captured video of the bear about 2.30 a.m. Wednesday. The footage shows the bear fleeing past the camera owner's home. Moments later, the cause of the bear dis- the bear's distress is revealed, a Pomeranian puppy chasing after the Bruin. The homeowner said the dog belongs to her neighbor. Colorado Parks and Wildlife warned residents that bears in the state are becoming more active as they prepare for hibernation. Okay, so moral of the story, it's not size that matters, but the it, spirit. Yes, it's... Not the size of the animal, it's the size of the fight in the animal. I fuck up the, how to say that. I've got to watch the video here. Oh my God, the bear is running. Like, you literally, oh my God. I hear the dog. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's hilarious. It's like, this big giant bear is just running. And then you see like the tiniest little dog coming from the other side, chasing after it. I'm like, that is tremendous. The other bears must be giving that poor bear the business now. They must, they're must. they never going to let him live that one down. Oh, yeah. Like, not at all. Uh, you know, if I was that bear, like, I don't know. I, I would start hibernating today. Hopefully it blows over and everyone forgets about it in the next summer. Uh, 24-hour news cycles, man, you know. 
The next time yeah. a bear just some, falls on like a trampoline or something, it'll you know blow over. Just sleep it off, bear. Sleep it off. <laughs> All right. So before we finish up, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no, I think I'm good for now. Awesome. So uh, that's going to wrap things up again. Thank you to everybody for listening. And we will talk to you again Thursday when we're back for NWA Worldwide Wrestling.